the summer, grass just comes out the ground. Animals eat it. Easy. But in the winter, when it's cold and dark, the grass doesn't grow as quickly. This is one of the key problems with farming. How do you feed your animals in the harsh winter months? In past times when people lived in mud huts, this might be done by eating your non-breeding animals in early winter to have a Christmas feast and save you having so many to worry about. But this isn't ideal because you're limiting the size of your herd to the amount that you can overwinter. What you need is a store of food. Now some bright spark way before the Roman period figured out that grass keeps really well if you dry it out. And he invented one of these, a scythe, to mow it. And of course these are best known today as an accessory made famous by disgraced fashion icon, Death. But before this disgraceful cultural appropriation took place, it was used to make hay like this. People would mow the grass with scythes and leave it to wilt in the sun, perhaps turning it over a few times to make sure it's properly dry. Then they'd transport it back to their yards or stack it in fields in a haystack that would often be thatched to keep it dry. You see in the background here. Dried grass is called hay and it allowed fodder from the summer to be consumed in the winter, which was quite important, hence most cities having a hay market. Haystacks have inspired art, although despite the title, these examples are actually straw stacks, which must be kept dry in the same way. Straw being the stem of a cereal crop used for bedding. Most bales and stacks you see today are straw rather than hay. When people got bored of doing everything manually, this process became mechanised. The horse-drawn mower replaced the scythe, the rake replaced casual labour gathering the hay, and eventually the acrobat was invented, which could both turn and rake up the grass. Since then, mows have got even bigger and they've invented lots of different types of machine. Quite a lot of haymaking today is done with a hay bob. If you're good at it, a hay bob flips the grass quite neatly so the underside gets a chance to dry. I'm not sure I was doing a perfect job here, but it was good enough. You can also rake it back together with a hay bob. But more modern farms nowadays tend to have tedders which flick the grass around more than turn it over. Generally, these are a lot wider, so you cover more ground. And then the hay is rowed up, baled and taken away. Easy peasy. There are disadvantages to hay. If there's any amount of rain after you mow it, it's probably ruined. You can turn it over and over and over and not get anywhere, and all the while the grass beneath it isn't growing. And if you bale it wet as it rots, it will heat up and then counterintuitively can set fire, which is a world of pain. This means you can only really hope to make hay in the warmest months of summer, and it's just not as good as fresh grass. So, in the Second World War, a different method was promoted. Instead of endlessly turning grass over in the hope that it might dry, you could pickle it and make something called silage. Silaging had existed since the 19th century, when some disturbed individual made sauerkraut out of grass. But in 1945, this man won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the invention of the modern process of silaging. This involved preserving grass by pickling it, with the addition of some acid and the prevention of contact with air. For silaging, the weather didn't have to be perfect. Rather, the grass was collected from the field and put straight into a trailer, still wet, and carted back to the yard. This machine is a forage harvester. Early examples tended to have a cutter bar or flail on the front to save the job of mowing. The basic principle of this design, with the trailer pulled behind the harvester, prevailed for most of the 20th century. Here's one my grandfather had with a trailer you can tell is homemade. And here is our current machine at work. It picks up the mowed grass, chops it up and throws it into the trailer behind, along with a little bit of pickling additive that you can see in the drum on the front of the tractor. Occasionally you see trailers that can pick grass up themselves. But as you might expect, modern silage production normally uses much bigger toys. Once mown, rows of grass will be raked together or thrown together with this conveyor belt machine to speed up the job of the harvester. Foragers themselves are typically massive self-propelled machines that pick up the grass, chop it and fling it into the trailers. This means tractors don't need to swap trailers with the forager after every load, but you do need to have several of them on the go at once. You might notice at the back of this shot that there are some buzzards flying around looking for any small creatures that might have been uncovered in the grass. We don't love this, the populations of buzzards and kites here are far too big and they've decimated the amounts of toads and other small creatures we have on the farm, which has also affected the owls that used to feed on them. But as birds of prey are protected species, there's not much we can do about it. You can also silage things other than grass. This year we've done maize or sweet corn, which is exactly the same principle. You still have a forager, although this time with a special header that allows it to cut the plants which it then chops and throws into trailers. The process is exactly the same. Once brought back to the yard, the silage is put in a structure called a clamp. A typical clamp is just a set of three walls like you see here that you can pack the silage inside. If the silage has any contact with air, it will rot rather than ferment. So the first thing we have to do is line the silo with plastic to make it as airtight as we can. You can see here we're cutting sheets to size for the sides and the back and then rolling them up 
They'll be unrolled later when the clamps fold to achieve an overlap between these side sheets and the top sheet that will go over the whole thing. Like most farmers, we make our side sheets out of the previous year's top sheet. So each year we only have to buy one sheet and that will see two years use before it's recycled. Then we set to work fixing the side sheets in place. You've got to be careful you do this in such a way the roll won't get trapped beneath the weight of the silage. We finished just as the first load from the forager pulled in. The people carting the maize will just back up and tip the trailers at the foot of the clump. At this point the maze is very light and fluffy and it has lots of air in it, which is what this machine is going to fix. The machine on the front of this tractor is called a buck rake. It allows you to pick silage up and move it around, tipping it off the front where you want it. While doing this, this tractor is compressing the maze down, squeezing the air out of it, which is why it has a weight on the back. There is a knack to this job. The trick is keeping the sides packed in so there's always more on the edges than there is in the middle of the clamp. Then if you roll the sides down the middle just sort of looks after itself and the entire clamp is compact. If you do this right you can just keep stacking it upwards even after the wall runs out. This is my grandfather using a rear mounted buck rake and he is a wizard at it. He stacks it absolutely vertically even without a wall. As the loads keep coming in the clamp's starting to get full. But as it started getting steeper, some soft patches developed and the book rake started struggling a bit. So they sent up a telehandler to help roll it down. By the time we were getting done, it had taken all day to do 50 acres and was getting dark. And by the time we were ready to put the top sheet on, it was dark and raining. So there was a bit of a rush because you don't want it to get too wet. I didn't film it, but we unrolled the sides and back sheet over the clamp and then put a top sheet over the whole thing, which is the black that you can see here. Here's a picture of my mum doing the side and back sheets last year, having a great time. Once it's covered up, we need to make sure that it stays airtight, so this green sheet is just acting as a weight, stopping any air blowing underneath the plastic. Then we throw on some more green sheets because we have spares and you can't really have too many. And then some little cylindrical green sacks full of stones just to make sure it's weighed down around the edges. It's very common to use old tyres for this purpose. And that's it, silage made. If you don't have a clamp, you can use something called an ag bag, which is sort of like a big silage sausage. But if these are on dirt, it's sort of hard to scoop loose stuff off the floor without digging it all up. Not ideal. But anyway, you leave it to ferment for a little while and then you open it up and you can feed it to animals. In the past, people have let cows feed themselves out of the silo. But nowadays, farmers usually serve silage up as part of a meticulously engineered diet, delivered nice and fresh to where the cows live in winter. Here's some of ours having a munch. Some people, if they keep their animals inside year round, will rely on silage even in the summer, which to me seems a little bit inefficient. But if you've got a massive herd, it can be difficult because they can only walk so far between milkings. Silage also has other uses. We don't have any animals at the moment, so the maize you just saw is actually going to an anaerobic digester to produce domestic gas. So it's being used for fuel rather than food. So I like silage. It doesn't use much plastic and you can recycle it afterwards anyway. It makes good cow food. But there's another way to make it that I like less. Rather than pick up the fodder and stick it in a clamp, you can bale it in the field and then wrap it. And this uses loads of plastic. Watch this. Now, I don't want to suggest that this isn't a very cool machine, but have a look at how much plastic it uses just for a single bale. So it rolls and spins the bale at the same time to make sure it's completely covered. And then it keeps going. Although the plastic is single use, it is recyclable. And these bales can be quite fun, at the end you get a nice big marshmallow. Of all my experience of agriculture, I genuinely believe that the worst environmental practice on British farms is an over-reliance on wrapped bales. Individually wrapped bales 
are useful, which is why people use them. If we were to open our clamp for six animals, say, the contact with air would cause it to rot faster than they could eat it. So I think we should normalise small clamps. Or at least long and thin clamps, so the face is small. I mean, we could store 50 acres of maize with that one sheet. That amount of fodder wrapped in bales would be crazy. Anyway, I hope you learned something. Do come by next time and I'll talk about something else.